Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to session four of the Words, Ideas, and Thinkers Institute. My name is Lynn Bolger. I am the executive director of the Authors Guild Foundation. Please silence your phones. <laughs> um, and also, um, exits are on either side of the sage, and there's red things, and uh, now Anthony won't get fired. Um, I need to take a minute to thank our wonderful sponsors and members of our Giving Society that make this happen. Um, Cromwell Harbor Foundation, Hunter Runet and Mark Vandenbosch. Yay! <laughs> uh, Joanne Leonhart Kosulu, Taryn and Mark Levitt, Diana Rowan Rockefeller, Maria Rana and Jonathan Yardley, Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation, Mirdad and Marilee Narani, October Mountain Financial, and Louise Hartwell White. Thank you. So um, we are going to talk today about changing the narrative on our parents. Um, Emma Straub will talk about her novel this time tomorrow which made me cry so hard, ugly, red face tears. Um, but it was very funny. Um, and you'll see exactly why in a minute. Um, and Maya Shambhag Lang will talk about a memoir she wrote about discovering her mother in a completely different way after she came to live with her. Um, Maya is our, the president of the Authors Guild Council, and <laughs> she is the author of What We Carry, named a New York Times book review editor's choice and a best book of 2020. She is also the author of The 16th of June, a modern reinterpretation of Ulysses that was long listed for the center of fi fiction first novel. Her essays have been widely published, and anthologized, the American Civil Rights Museum named her a woman you should know, winner of the Neil Shepard Prize in Fiction. After graduating magna cum laude from Swarthmore, she earned her MA from NYU and her PhD in comparative literature from SUNY Stony Brook. Her dissertation, The Hydro Hypochondriac, Bodies in Pro test from Herman Melville, who's been coming up a lot this, this festival, to Toni Morrison, won the Mildred and Herbert Weisinger Award. She is also a competitive class weightlifter, so watch out. <laughs> she is talking to her friend and co-writer, Emma Str not co-writer, also another writer, <laughs> that's what I mean. Emma Straub, who is a New York Times best-selling author of six books for adults, the novels This Time Tomorrow, All, it, All Adults Here, The Vacationers, Modern Lovers, Laura's Lament, Li Laura Lamont's Life in Pictures, and the short story collection Other People We Married. She is also the author of three picture books, the most recent which is The Hats. Very good hats. Very good hats. Um, Emma and her husband own Books Are Magic. Now there are two in Brooklyn. Yes, and she is one of those people like um, Anne Lamott. I mean, sorry, not Anne Lamott. Anne Patchett, thank you. And um, Judy Bloom and um, Louise Erdrich, who are writers and booksellers, and they're the most generous people authors and promoting other people's work. So um, thank you both. Um, Maya, take it away, please. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I want to start off by saying, Emma, that it's such a pleasure genuinely to be here with you, not only because you are a richly, superbly talented writer, but also, as Lynn mentioned, because you are a beloved person in the literary community. So really, this is a joy for me. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> <laughs> so it's true that both of our books deal with the question of parents, and specifically caring for parents during illness. For me, in a memoir about my mother, and for you in a novel, This Time Tomorrow, which you have said openly is the closest thing you've ever written to memoir. 
And I think our books actually share quite a bit in common, more actually than I had even anticipated. Um, so to start, I thought that we might each read just a page from each of our books to get the conversation between them and us going. So if you could start us off, that would be great. Sure. I'm happy to be here with you too, Maya. I, don't, I never know what to say when people are like, you're a beloved, I'm like, I don't know. Am I, that's, I would never say that about myself, but it's very nice. But that's what a beloved person okay, says. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, so the little page I'm going to read is, uh, so w Alice, the main character of the book, has, uh, she's 40 years old and uh, somewhat unhappy in her life, unfulfilled, um, and she's just gone out and gotten very drunk on her birthday, and uh, she wakes up in her bed, in her, in the, you know, her father, in the apartment that she grew up in with her father. Um, and she has just come out. In the, in the present, her father is quite sick, dying in the hospital. But in this scene, he's sitting at the kitchen table and she doesn't really know what's going on. Um, Leonard Stern was sitting in his spot at the kitchen table. There was a cup of coffee next to him and an open can of Coca-Cola. Next to his drinks, Leonard had a plate with some toast and a few hard-boiled eggs. Alice thought she could see an Oreo, too. The clock on the wall behind the table said that it was seven in the morning. Leonard looked good. He looked healthy. Healthier, actually, than Alice could ever remember him looking. He looked like he could run around the block if he wanted to, just for fun, like the kind of dad who could play catch and teach his kid how to ice skate, even though he absolutely wasn't. Leonard looked like a movie star, like a movie star version of himself, handsome, young, and quick. Even his hair looked bouncy, its waves full and the deep, rich brown they had been in her childhood. When had his hair started to gray? Alice didn't know. Leonard looked up and made eye contact with her. He turned to look at the clock, back to Alice, and shook his head. You are up early, though. A new leaf. I like it. What was happening? Alice closed her eyes. Maybe she was hallucinating. That was possible. Maybe she had gotten beyond drunk, so drunk that she was still, many hours later, more drunk than she had ever been in her entire life, and she was seeing things. Maybe her father had died, and this was his ghost. Alice started to cry and rested her cheek against the cool wall. Her father pushed his chair back from the table and slowly walked toward her. Alice didn't take her eyes off him. She was afraid that if she looked away, he would disappear. What's happening, birthday girl? Leonard smiled. His teeth looked so white and so straight. She could smell the coffee on his breath. It's my birthday, Alice said. I know it's your birthday. Leonard said, you've made me watch 16 candles enough times to ensure I wouldn't let this one slide. I did not buy you a boy with a sports car, though. What? She said. Where was her wallet? Where was her phone? Alice patted her body again, looking for anything that belonged to her that made this make sense. She pushed her enormous t-shirt against her body and felt her flat stomach, her hip bones, her body. It's your 16th birthday, Al pal. Leonard nudged his leg, her leg with his toe. Had he always been able to stretch like that? He hadn't moved his body that easily in years. It felt exactly like when she saw her friend's children for the first time in a few years, and all of a sudden they were full-on humans who could skateboard and came up to her shoulders, but in reverse. She'd seen her father every day, then every week or so for her entire life. There was never a gap, a time when she could see him with fresh eyes. She'd been there for every gray hair's arrival, so of course she hadn't noticed when the balance had shifted, when it was more salt than pepper. Want an Oreo for breakfast? Thank you. And before I read my excerpt, as you have gathered from that, Emma's novel involves time travel. And True. <laughs> um, and... And it fascinated me, right, to bring together 
this intersection of hopping around through time and family life because typically those would not converge, right? On one hand, we have this kind of universe-bending aspect of being able to hop through time, going from Alice at 40 to Alice back at 16 in a science fiction fantasy sort of way. And throughout, this is very much a father-daughter story with the specificity and groundedness and the gorgeous mundane details of daily life between a father and daughter. Um, and when I was caring for my mom, I felt like strange things happened with time. And that's part of why I loved that intersection and convergence that you do in your novel. So I thought I would read a passage where time does funny things to me. And this takes place after my daughter has, I mean, after my mother has been living with us for a few months. I am brushing my daughter's hair one morning. She is seven. While she tries to squirm out from under me, and I hear myself say, you should be glad. Grandma never used to brush my hair. Lucky you, Zoe mutters. I smile, but it occurs to me that she is right. I brush her hair for my sake. I don't want her to be bullied or to be looked at with pity by her teachers, as I was. But those are my fears. What seems a maternal act is, at heart, a selfish one. I remember years ago when my mom would visit me in New York, her car loaded up with strange offerings. I knew it was a gesture of love, but those items felt like they had nothing to do with me at all. Paper towels, Claritin, wide-spectrum antibiotics. <laughs> they were the same items she used to pack in a Samsonite suitcase to bring to her parents in India. Their life was comfortable there, but they didn't have ready access to certain Western conveniences. Maybe my mom brought me items she wished someone had brought her. Maybe I brushed Zoe's hair because I wish someone had done it for me. Maybe at our most maternal, we aren't mothers at all. We're daughters reaching back in time for the mothers we wished we'd had and then finding ourselves. We forget, I think, in the act of caring who is being cared for, that it is not our own hair getting brushed, our own mouths being fed, our own needs being met. We do what wasn't done for us. We hope it will be enough. Oh, good. So, you know, often when I was, I was a 30-something mom caring for my mom with a young kid, and I would have these moments, they weren't simply flashbacks. It was as though the universe was folding on itself and I was in two places at once, which is why the frame of your novel, I think, is such a powerful one. So I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about that, about the choice to, which is, you know, a, an audacious choice to have Alice be hopping around in time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that really it, it, it's, it's exactly what you just described. It's exactly what you just described, that I wanted to give myself. So it was, I started writing this book in 2020 um, when my father was in the hospital for several months. It wasn't COVID related, but it was in high, that first summer of COVID. And so, you know, there were restrictions about who could who could go to the hospital and how many people could be there and so on and so on. So the only times that I left my house really other than a walk around the block were to go to the hospital to sit with my dad all day. And he and I <clears throat> would have these marathon conversations, the kind of conversations that we had not been able to have <clears throat> since before I had children. Um, just because we were never alone for that long. I mean, you know, certainly, like, you know, my small children would never, ever, still cannot 
let me have a, an uninterrupted adult conversation <laughs> with literally anyone, but especially not their grandfather who they love and who, you know, whose attention they wanted as much as, if not more than they wanted mine. Um, but he and I had these long, long conversations and my father was a novelist and so we talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about fiction and we talked a lot about work and ourselves and our lives and I had put aside a book that I was writing because it was like this hilarious romp. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but in the summer of 2020, I was not in a particularly hilarious mood. And so I couldn't work on my hilarious romp. And I said, oh, I don't know what I should do, Dad. And he said, well, you should write a novel about a woman who visits her father in the hospital. Mm. I said, okay. And immediately I knew exactly what it was. I knew exactly what it was. I knew it was us, and I knew it was time travel, and I knew that what I wanted to do was to be, was to, was to shift my position backwards so I wasn't a parent where I was just a child. Mm. And it was, I will probably cry at some point, just FYI, but I, I mean, it was the best gift that I have ever given anyone um, and I gave it to myself first and then I gave it to my father. I love that and part of what I really felt while reading your novel was this joy, this absolute joy and I think actually in caring for my mother, you know, so my mother uh, came to live with me during her dementia and she was a geriatric psychiatrist whose specialty was dementia. And every morning as her caregiver, I would place Aricept, which is the leading uh, dementia medication. I would place it in her palm. She had once uh, run clinical trials for Aricept. And so it was one of those moments of being, you know, I was putting it in her palm, wondering if she remembered that she had run the clinical trials that led to this medication. Um, and when people think about caring for a parent or just caregiving, so often there's, you know, people's faces kind of collapse and they think, oh, that must be terrible and awful. But there's this real gift of that time. And interestingly, what I felt was in those conversations between Alice and her father, and I imagine between you and your father, that there's a real window or sort of portal to be able to go into those conversations with a certain awareness um, and, and significance. Not in a way that's necessarily weighty, but just, yeah. just seizing the kind of opportunity of that. Yeah, I mean, one, one of my friends who's a, who's a novelist who's, whose uh, mother had died recently said to me, sort of in the beginning of of this period of time, she said, just record everything. Like, just tape record him. Just, you'll be happy to have it, whatever it is. Even if you're talking about nothing, just, just record it so you have it. Um, and I did, and I, you know, and I did, and a lot, most of those conversations were, like, totally inconsequential. But, but in that period of time, we did, you know, I, I should just back up and say that, like, you know, I, my father and I had a, an extremely rare relationship in that we always got along. We always got along. We never had any problems with each other. Um, I mean, well, I say that. He might have had tons of problems with me, but I don't think so. Um, but, but we also were like a comedy team. And so we were, we joked around and we were sarcastic and I teased him constantly and I never really said anything nice to him. Like I would, I just, why would I do that? He knows, he knew, so I didn't have to. Um, but what writing this book let me do was be as openly loving to him 
as I had always been, really. But but I had never, I just, I had never been like this. This is how I feel about you. Here you are. Yeah. Um, and I and I did, and it it was it was an incredible feeling. And I, you know, I think that that is something, you know. I think it depends, you know, obviously it depends every everyone's relationship with their parents is different. Certainly even within a family, you know, like I think so much about how different my relationship with my parents is than my brother's relationship with my parents or my relationship with my two children, you know, all of those things. Um there are a thousand variables, but yeah, being being able to to sort of tear away inside using the artifice of a book and the trope of science fiction and time travel i was able to get to the core of absolute honesty in mm. a way that i had never done as fiction often allows us to do yeah and i mean it's interesting with my mother during her dementia her kind of typical everyday armor fell away and so it was a similar thing you know uh, humor can be a certain defense mechanism. For my mom, she was really this mythic, self-aggrandizing force of nature. All of that fell away. Um, so I got kind of newfound access to her. One of my favorite aspects of This Time Tomorrow is the way that Alice gets to re-experience her 16-year-old self. So imagine getting transported back into your teenage body. And some of it is, you know, the marvel of the corporeal experience of not having aches and pains, being able to stretch out on a couch in some contorted position from adolescence that's unthinkable now. But also, I really relished the details of her home from the passage you read, the coffee and the, you know, Leonard's Coke and the hard-boiled egg, the clock on the wall, all of those sensory details. It made me think, so often with science fiction and fantasy, there's this question of if we could go back in time, what would we do? What would we change? And it's always about action, right? Would you take that one step, do that one thing, nudge the parent to get the checkup sooner? How can you affect history if you could go back? What I loved was I think part of the answer you put forward is maybe what we really want and what really pulls us is just the chance to go back and sit and take it all in, in the kind of hunger of memory and take in all of those details that were perhaps lost to us the first time around. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's all about attention, you know, and being present. I had a Zoom, I did a Zoom <laughs> the other day with, um, with this, very industrious teenage girl who lives in my neighborhood who had organized um, a, a teenage, a Zoom teenage literary festival. Can you imagine? I was so, I was, I was so impressed by this um, young person. But so she, she had arranged the Zoom and so I was on this Zoom call with about 25 or 30 teenagers and one of them asked, you know, and. They're all, I can see them in all the little boxes. They are all in, obviously, their teenage bedrooms because those are their current bedrooms. And they, one of them asked me <laughs> about research. You know, you know you're old when you've written a book that takes place in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, and, and a teenager asks you about historical research. <laughs> Oh, you know, they picture you going to a library and sliding out some gigantic paper map. I don't know. Um, but I said to them, <laughs> I said to them, if you, it just trust me that in 25 years, you will be able to close your eyes and perfectly see the rooms that you are sitting in right now. That this, this period in time, and maybe it's not true for everyone, but I, I think that for, for a lot of people, and certainly for me, 
especially because I lived in one place. You know, I think for people who move who move around a lot, maybe it's it's trickier, but I lived in one place. My parents lived in one house from when I was four until I was 35, they moved out of that house. And so I was in that room a lot. And I can, I can close my eyes and I can see it, you know? I can see all of the, the, the movie posters and the things that I've taped up and the pictures of my friends and the, you know, lipstick blotted kisses and, you know, the piles of clothing everywhere and my, um, just the, you know, the, my childhood. I can see my childhood perfectly. And when I was writing this book, I, I wanted to go, and it, you know, it was something <laughs> that I didn't, you know, this festival is all about ideas, and so I want to take credit for this idea, but it's really, it, it's really something that I did completely unconsciously, is that I, built myself a little memory palace um, during the pandemic because I couldn't go, you know, I couldn't go anywhere, but you know, where could you go if you could, if you could go, if you could, if you could go anywhere, I would want to go to the place where I felt the safest. Mm. And the place where I felt the safest was the Upper West Side of Manhattan in the mid-1990s. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think actually, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. As I think so often when people think about writing a novel, they think that they have to be like seated behind some mahogany desk, plotting things out and coming up with something really clever. But, you know, you mentioned that you were in the middle of writing something that you no longer felt you could write. And this premise that if you were to describe to someone, like, there's going to be time traveling while some, you know, while a woman is caring for her ailing father. It doesn't sound like it can necessarily work, and yet it totally does for all the reasons we've discussed. I, I mean, number one, there's no plot. You know, like I, when I had to call my editor <laughs> and tell her what I was doing, because at that point I was in it. Like, she couldn't have stopped me. She, she could not have stopped me. She could have chosen not to publish it when I was through, but she couldn't have stopped me from writing it. And I just, I, you know, I had to call her and I say, yeah, remember that book that I was writing for you? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not writing that and here's what I'm writing. And, you know, she and I luckily had worked on several, you know, five books before and so she trusted me, but but she said, oh, okay, okay, go for it. See, you know, let's see. But yeah, I, it's, it's funny because it's, you know, often I, it's been described as, as science fiction or whatever. It's, it got on all these lists. Um, and it's not, it's really, it's not. truly not yeah. science fiction. Um, but it, but it, does, it does play with that. And, you know, part of that, part of the reason that I wanted to do it also is that Leonard, the father in the book, is a science fiction writer. And my father was not a science fiction writer, but he was a horror novelist. And so he wrote genre books, always. I mean, his, I would never, you know, relegate him to that corner um, in the way that some people do. Uh, but, you know, that, that was also part of it, that I wanted to say, over here, in my, you know, uh, you know, literary novelist zone, I want to play with all of that stuff, and I want to, you know, pay homage to all of that, um, and to the people who create that, even though it's not what I'm doing. It's about it, you know. It's about fantasy, um, even if it isn't quite playing by those rules. Yeah, I mean, I think it's about the the very human impulse that drives that fantasy um, and the, the human yearning uh, beneath it. So you've spoken publicly and candidly about this being close to a memoir. And uh, as you mentioned, you were caring for your father while writing it. I noticed in an interview that you used the term 
pre-grieving, which was a term that I um, had on my radar when I was caring for my mom, and I was hoping that you could just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like obviously there are no good ways to have your parents die. You know, like it, it, it's it's not like um, there are great ways to have it happen, and you know, there are certainly worse ways. Um, but I, you know, I I don't even think that I was really aware of it. I mean, I talked about it in therapy every week as I was writing this. Um, so I was aware of it to some degree, but but I think that it is not to be underestimated how much really diving into the grief before it happens can help. Mm -hmm. Because when, so, so the book came out in May of, what year is it now? In May of 2022, um, in hardcover, and, um, and my father died in September. So, but he got to see, he got to see all of it. I mean, he, he got to read the book. He read the book so many times. He read it so many times. And he would <laughs> sometimes just call me and be like, I'm reading it again. I'm on chapter whatever. It's so good. You know, it was, he just got so much pleasure out of it. And that was before I went on like, you know, fresh air to talk about how great he was. Like he just loved it all because every interview I did, every review of the book, every, he was mentioned, he was top, top billing. Um, which for a man who had a very large ego was just like, it was his dream. It was his dream. Um, even though like, you know, I, it is extremely autobiographical, but you know, he would have been the very, very, very first to say that Leonard, the father in the novel, is not him. Um, I, I had to tone him down <laughs> so much um, in order to suit my purposes. Um, but because I didn't, I didn't, it, it, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't about um, painting a, a, like a perfectly accurate portrait of him. It was about painting a perfectly accurate portrait of us. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so, and so I did that. But, but yeah, so the pre-grieving, just going back to the pre-grieving, so I, you know, I did, um, I did all of this, um, you know, it, I was talking about him dying so much before he died. I basically spent a year thinking about it, talking about it, talking about it in therapy, talking about it on the radio, I mean, talking about it in bookstores. Um, and so when it, when it happened, when it actually happened, I felt absolutely at peace. I, I was devastated. I remain devastated. But I felt absolutely secure that I had communicated to him everything I needed to and that he had with me. Of course, there are a million things that I wish I could ask him any given day. You know, it's not like I, I, I wish I could, you know, I'm writing a novel now and this morning I was thinking like, oh God, I, it would just be really nice. It would be really nice. And I will have those feelings for, forever for the rest of my life, of course. Um, but, but through the, the joint acts of writing and publishing this book, we were able to get to this place where I felt like I didn't, I didn't have to say I didn't, there, there was nothing that I had missed saying. That's so beautiful. And what a gift for both of you. And, you know, when you were mentioning him calling you to say, I'm reading it again, I could actually see that through Leonard in a certain way, even though I get that Leonard is a fictional character, is very different. You know, Leonard jokes with Alice about the time travel, right? So, so that dynamic is absolutely there. Um, and I think, I mean, I imagine for you, certainly it was the case for me, that writing has always been the way of getting through something and negotiating 
life and kind of an act of sense making. And so to turn to the space of writing and be able, being able to process these events as they unfold is, I think, deeply uh, necessary during that juncture. God, God, yes. I mean, I think that, you know, the, so the day, the day, <laughs> so the day that my father died, the, the day before we had had a sleepover for my son's birthday, his birthday had been a, a couple weeks before, but we had a sleepover with his friends and I'd taken him and his two best friends to see Hamilton, which if you haven't thought about Hamilton in a while, the second half is really sad. <laughs> the second half is all about death. And I spent it just weeping with these nine-year-olds, three nine-year-olds. Um, they didn't notice. They were fine. Uh, but, but, but the next day, I was at the hospital with my mother all day long. And my father died at the end of the day. And the day after that was my children's first day of school. Oh. And so my husband walked the children to school and I walked to my office and started writing about it immediately. Because I didn't, it, it, was, the, it was the only thing I could do. It was the only thing I wanted to do. Yeah. It was what he would have wanted me to do. Um, and it just, it just felt so natural and it just made me feel so grateful to have an outlet you know it just made me think about how lucky we are as writers to be able to put things down on paper i started writing poems again i like i i was always a poet in in high school and in college i really like thought that that was my career path same actually but then nobody liked my poems. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Which really sort of put a wrench in the spokes. Um, but, you know, now I'm 43. I don't care anymore. I don't care if nobody else likes my poems. I like my poems. And so I started writing poems again. Um, and, and it was all I could write about, you know, for, I, I mean, many, many, many months. And um, yeah, it just, it just made me feel so sorry for, for people who, who don't have an, like obviously it's not all writing, but you know, for, you know, I don't know. I just think I have so many friends where I wish I could give them a paintbrush or a lump of clay or just something to channel. Um, those feelings because it's there's so much and you you, you need I, I have felt like I really ha have to put it somewhere physically yes yeah there you, there's that need to take it all and put it somewhere and I think also I mean what is writing if not time travel right like part of what it affords us is the ability to hit the pause button and to kind of open a portal and say I'm going to create this bracketed space where I'm in this time, and I can make a choice to be in this time. Um, yeah, and, and like, I mean, that, you know, to me, like, that's, that's what this book is really about. I mean, it's about, you know, me and, and my father, but really, it's about fiction. Mm -hmm. It's about fiction. It's like, I mean, I, you know, I say in the book, or <laughs> me, I, Alice, who is, not me, says in the book that, um, you know, that like <clears throat> fiction was her father's religion, you know? And like that's, that is the house that I grew up in. Um, I mean, it wasn't just fiction, it was also poetry and um, uh, it was books, it was picture books, it was everything. It was if it was bound between two covers and you could dive inside. Mm. Um, that was what was absolutely holy in my household. Mm. And so I feel like that, I mean, that, so it's, it's, it's the, that's this book, but it's also every other book. Right. Um, I wanted to read you just a quick thing from this time tomorrow, because there's 
<laughs> there's a dynamic that you captured kind of uncannily. Um, this is Alice when she has time traveled a few times. Alice realized that she was going back mostly for dinner, just to have those hours where she and her dad or she and her dad and Sam sat around a table talking about nothing in particular. Leonard was always so happy when she told him about the time travel. It became Alice's favorite part. He was surprised every time and sometimes clapped his hands with delight. She told him this one thing over and over again, knowing how he would react, a present to them both. So you had no way of knowing this, obviously, when you wrote this. For me, this uncannily captured a kind of dynamic between me and my mother with her dementia, where I would do this thing of, I would give my mother a childhood photo album, and every time it was new to her, and every time she would react the same way, exactly as you described, you know, she would kind of clap her hands in delight, and she would lean forward, and she would have the same excited expression on her face, and it did indeed become this gift for us both. And so there's something about the time travel of with Alice going back to Leonard and those moments where she's been there before and he hasn't and she gets to witness him reacting. Um, I just wanted to share the, the way that that I love resonated. That. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I cry. I'm crying. It's fine. It's fine. I got teary-eyed too. <laughs> <laughs> I love to cry in public now. You know, I. It's funny. The same way, like after I gave birth, uh, um, I felt like I could be fully naked in front of absolutely anyone. Yes, I did too. After after my father died, that's how I feel about crying. Like I feel like I'm gonna cry, and that's fine. I went. <laughs> I went just about a month after he died, I went to Italy for my um, Italian publication of This Time Tomorrow, and I had canceled everything. I had canceled everything for about six weeks after he died. But there was this trip to Italy, and I just thought, <laughs> he would want me to go to Italy. I want to go to Italy, and so I went. And I was sitting there in this hotel lobby getting interviewed over and over by these Italian journalists with an, with an interpreter next to me, just crying. And these Italian journalists were so frightened of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was fine. I was happy. I was so happy. But they were so confused. But I feel safe here. <laughs> This is our safe space. But also, you know, like the Greeks would have loved that, right? <laughs> um, they would have found it very healthy. So um, shifting notes, and I just, you know, I do want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience. Um, so start thinking about what you want to ask. Um, but I, one thing I wanted to ask about is, I know that you grew, grew up in New York. I'm a native New Yorker. And this is a New Yorker's New York Meaning, like, we don't just get Gray's papaya. We also get those odd high tables that they used to have at Gray's papaya by the windows. Um, and so I just, I really wondered what that was like for you. Um, because in a way, writing about New York, which we can have very, you know, like an intimate relationship with what the city means to us, if that can present its own challenges. So I wondered if that was daunting to you or if it was a really welcome opportunity that you'd always wanted to explore? You know, writing about, writing novels that take place in New York City was always on my, like, personal, like, no-fly zone. I just thought, there are so many. <sighs> Who needs more? And I, and I wrote um, my novel, Modern Lovers, takes place in, in Ditmas Park in Brooklyn, which... If you, if you don't know it, Ditmas Park is the neighborhood in Brooklyn that looks the least like you think it would. Um, it's got these beautiful, enormous Victorian mansions with yards and, you know, front yards and backyards and garages and things like that. Um, so I sort of, you know, I, I wrote about this, this neighborhood in 
you know, quite near me that that didn't feel like New York as it is. Was that like the gateway drug into yeah. writing? <laughs> well, but then I thought I got so many. Uh, I got so many um, emails on my website from. I don't want to stereotype persnickety readers, but I will just say, men. I got so many. <laughs> I got so many emails from men, saying. Well, I know that on Argyle Road, it, it, traffic actually runs south, and so, or whatever. As if it mattered. As if it mattered. It did not matter to me. Um, it mattered to them. It did not matter to me. And I just thought, oh, God, it's such a headache. I don't want to do that. I don't, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that. So in, my, in the novel after that, I made up a town. It's Rhinebeck. The next book takes place in Rhinebeck, but I call it something else because I didn't want all of the readers, the men, <laughs> in Rhinebeck to say the traffic runs north-south or whatever. Um, but, but with this, with this, there was no, there, I, I couldn't, I couldn't put it anywhere else. I mean, what I, you know, I, 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 what I did was I picked the street on the Upper West Side that seems to me the most likely to have a time travel portal on it, which is Pomander Walk, which if you've ever been to Symphony Space, which I'm sure you have, it's um, directly around the corner. It's on 95th, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a little tiny, and Broadway, yes, see, see, <laughs> see, you've been. Um, it's, it's behind, what, yes, between Broadway and West End Avenue. <laughs> and it, it's behind a gate, and it's, it's these little, these little gingerbready Tudor houses um, that look absolutely out of place. Um, and I just thought, well, yes, that's where it is. That's where it is. If there's, you know, it's anachronistic, it's, it's, it's um, hidden, it's secret, it's perfect. Um, and so I, so, I put it, so I put it there, um, and I had Alison Leonard live there on that street. Um, but, you know, I did not, I grew up all the way on 85th Street, about 10 blocks away. Um, but... I had such a good time populating the blocks in between 85th Street and 95th Street. I, you know, like, I got, and I get so many emails now from all kinds of people who say, FOWAD, or, which was this, like, big discount clothing store, right? FOWAD! You know, all of these places that, uh, that 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 aren't um, you know that aren't Grace Papaya. I mean, Grace Papaya to me is the greatest restaurant in New York City, um, but you know, and and a landmark I think to people who aren't me, in addition to me. Um, but I I just had so much fun thinking about all of the tiny restaurants and shops and laundromats and bars that uh, that I passed every day, every day, every day for my whole life. And then I had the fun of writing to all of my friends from childhood because they were all stuck at home too um, with their deranged small children and saying, you know, so what will I, what will I absolutely kick myself for, for forgetting? And they gave me so many things that I absolutely would have kicked myself. Like, like how the block that H and H Bagels was on smell block totally, and how hot those oh, bags scorching. were. Yes. The bagels were so hot in the air. Oh God, um, just things like that, you know. And I, I mean, I think that like those are those are the those are the memories that are in the deepest place, um, most sturdily attached in my brain and. Um, it was such a joy to go back there. Um, and, it, and it alleviated my worries of writing a New York novel because, you know, as I said, my editor could have stopped me, could have told me that not to do it. 
Um, but, but really, like, no one, no one could have stopped me from writing this book the way that I did. And it's, you know, I, it's, it's kind of terrifying. It's kind of terrifying to me, actually, because I just think that, like, I, you know, I poured, I poured so much of myself into this book. And when I started writing the book that I'm writing now, which is also full of things that are dear to me in various other ways, I just think, like, I mean, it feels sort of like after you have a child and you think, like, could I love another? Could I love another as much as I love that one? Um, just because the writing of this felt so different. Yeah. Well, that joy and that sense of place absolutely comes through, and it's such a gift to encounter it on the page. So I think that's probably a good place for us to segue to our Q&A portion. Before we do so, I just want to give Emma a big round of applause for all that she has shared. Thanks, Maya. So I would love to take, as the house lights come on, that was done very seamlessly, um, questions from the audience, yes. Sure. Um, so, and so the question was... Yeah, so the question was, that. what happened to my mother? That's the question. Um, so I made an extremely conscious decision when I began planning this novel that no one else was invited. My parents were married for 56 years when my dad died. I have an older brother. They were not invited. They were not invited. I didn't want to have to worry about anyone else's feelings. Um, I think one of the things, one of the amazing gifts that my father gave to me long before I gave this to him was that he had made it really clear to me indirectly, that fiction was safe, no matter what kind of fiction it was. In his fiction, there were serial killers and murders and um, horrible things happened to children all the time. And that was fine. That was good. It was healthy because he, he himself had had an extremely traumatic childhood and he needed somewhere to put that. And so that's what he did. He put every terrifying, scared, rageful feeling into his fiction. And that was allowed. That was allowed. No one was gonna tell him not to, certainly not us. And so when I, you know, like, he, he made this comment to me, you should write a book about a woman in the hospital, you know. But I don't think he actually thought I was going to do it. But when I, when I did decide that I was going to do it, I, I told him, and he said, okay. And then when I gave it to him, when I was finished, he read it the first time, and he said, you know, Emma, it's, it's quite personal. There's a lot of personal stuff in there. And I said, Dad, if there's anything that you want me to take out, I will. And he said, what do you think I want you to take out? And I said, nothing. And he said, that's right. Whatever I put in my book was okay with him. And most people, <laughs> I don't know if you have this experience, most people in the world do not feel that way. You know, most people in the world, if, if I said, do you mind if I write a novel about you? Do, I mind, do you mind if I write a memoir about our experience? Most people would, would get extremely nervous and would want, um, you know, approval. But he didn't. Um, and I, I, I knew that I was lucky to have that. And so I, I didn't want to press my luck and try to include anyone else. 
Um, my mother and brother know that I love them very much, um, but I don't think they want to live in my novels. Two things I just want to add to that that I was thinking about while you were talking. One, you know, it's interesting because I wrote a mother-daughter story and I do not have a good relationship with my father at all. Um, he was an abusive, controlling person. We are estranged from one another. So when I read your book, part of the gift of it, which was quite healing for me, was to be in the space of this father-daughter relationship, with which, truthfully, literature does not often delve into the father-daughter space. And so there was something quite magical about that. Also, just as a side note, when I gave an early draft of my memoir to my brother, um, I said to him, I was not as generous as you, I said to him, if there's anything that bothers you, I would like to know, because I love you. I'm not going to change it, <laughs> but I would want to know. <laughs> so, um, okay, question, yeah. Um, no, my, so my, my editor, so sorry, the question was, uh, the, the book is so personal, what was the editing process like? Um, I did not battle with her. The, the, the poor soul who I had to battle with most was the copy editor. <laughs> so the thing about time travel is that it messes things up. Um, and so this poor woman had to go through and say, okay, Emma, it, she's gone back and forth four times, so you say it's a Monday, but really it's Thursday. Things like that. Um, so I, I say it was a battle. It, it, it wasn't a battle. She was battling me, and I was grateful uh, to have her eyes and brain on it. Um, but yeah, no, that, that was the trickiest part of editing the book, really, was, was making sure that the time travel was clear and clean and, and, and straight. Um, but no, my, my editor was so... Um, hands off, really. I mean, th there were a couple of things that we talked about. You know, the, she wasn't absent, um, but she understood that this meant more to me than any other book that we had worked on together previously. Um, and so she was, she was very gentle, um, which is why we can still be friends now. <laughs> yeah. That's a very interesting question. So the question is for, for books that, that, that appear autobiographical, is, it, you know, is, the, is something sort of gained or lost by admitting that? Um, I, you know, I have a lot of friends who are writers. I don't know, this is a very interesting question to me because I think that it happens so often that people don't do what I'm doing and don't say, yes, this is in fact a map of my teenage bedroom and a map of my teenage brain or whatever, that people are, 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 are very reluctant to do that, I think, because, I, I don't know, I mean, there are a thousand reasons that we can think of, you know, that, that, that maybe an autobiographical story um, sort of cheapens the uh, imagination, I don't know. I mean, I think that there are, there are ways that reasons that people don't want to admit it. But I think mostly for people who I know who have written what I know to be extremely autobiographical things and not shared that, it's because it, it turns into the thing that people want to talk about. And I mean, for, for me, that's perfect because I just want to talk about my dad. Like that, that is what I want to talk about. But I think for a lot of people, they don't, they don't want that. You know, they want the, 
you know, the interviewer or the reviewer or whoever to talk about, you know, the quality of the novel's construction. They want to talk about the, the, all of the millions of choices that go into making a book. Um, and, and, you know, it, it can be quite distracting. I would say that happens particularly to young women novelists. I don't know if I still qualify in the young category, but, but that happens all the time to young women where, where people will say, oh, so which one are you? You know, as if you're taking like a sex in the city, like quiz, personality quiz, um, where, you know, yeah, I don't know. Be people, so I, un I understand, I very much understand writers who, who don't want to admit it. Um, and, and also sometimes the, the writers just don't want to, to admit it full stop. Like I was somewhere, I won't say who, but I was standing um, outside an event just like this with an extremely, extremely famous novelist. And a man came up to her and said, you wrote about me. You wrote about me in this, in this story. And she, she straightened her spine and sort of shook her head and said, oh, how interesting, or whatever. You know, she was like not engaging with it and then she went away. And then she was like, I totally did. <laughs> You know, it wasn't for him to know. It wasn't for him to know, even though he did. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And one quick thing. You know, I don't know if you guys have read On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous by Ocean Vong, which if you haven't, you should. And he has talked openly about the fact that the people who've read his poetry um, will recognize the outline of his life, you know, his mother. And, but he also said that making that book a novel was necessary for him in order to give himself the latitude and the permission to explore certain dynamics. So one thing I would say is that if you're writing about your own life and you fictionalize it to conceal yourself or for your own kind of protection, that can come through, right? I think it's important, one of the pacts you make with the reader when writing memoir is that I'm not, I'm going to be vulnerable, I'm not going to hide, I'm going to put the most difficult things to say out there, and usually it's the scariest things to say that are the most necessary. And I think when writing about one's own life, if turning to fiction is not to protect oneself, but actually to enable you to voice certain things, explore certain things, turn up the volume, uh, highlight, that's different. And and so I think that distinction is important. Okay, I saw a hand over here. Yeah. We can cry together, it's okay.
First of all, thank you. And I give, I give you a big hug, and I'll give you a big hug in a minute when I get off of this beautiful stage. Um, but in terms of um, sort of negative self-talk and, and like feeling like you don't have anything to say, I feel like that all the time. You know, I think we all do. I think all writers, I think it sounds like a writer to me, you know? <laughs> I think that you, you just, the, the biggest trick, the biggest trick of being a writer is actually writing. That's the only requirement. That's the only requirement. That's all you have to do. You just have to sit down and you know, some, I have some friends who are like, oh, I have to write 300 words every morning at the stroke of five when I wake up. Or some people write a page a day. Some people write in their journals, you know, every day or whatever. You know, you have to figure out what works for you. Um, but, but it's really just showing up and not minding if it's terrible. Um, because sometimes it is. Usually it is, at least in the beginning, you know? That's, I mean, and I don't mean in the beginning of your writing career. I mean in the beginning when you sit down that day. You know, I, I don't know, maybe other people don't feel this way, but... You know, I feel like it takes a while to get warmed up every day, even if you are a professional writer and, and it's your whole job to supposed to be good at that, you know? Um, so I would say be as easy on yourself as you possibly can be in all ways and to just, to just try to show up on the page and just see what happens for just a, for a little while, for a little while, and then come back to it. Thank you, thank you. And when, when you come to the bookstore, we've got walkie-talkies. So if, if I'm there, I will, you know, and I will come, and I will come and say hello. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna take the last um, question, and it's for Maya because it really echoes and resonates with what that young woman just shared with us, which was lovely. And that is, um, tell us about the title of your book and how we just had this really remarkable conversation in the green room. So many good things happen in the green room. And um, how, do you know exactly what I'm talking about? I do. And, and how that, yeah, so could you do that? And then we'll break. <laughs> word for word, please. <laughs> Um, I love that your question was basically, can you do the thing? And I will try and do the thing. So, one quick thing though, can I just, because I, oh, is she still here? She just left. Oh, if I tell you, will you pass it on to her? Some, okay. I just want to mention, well, for anyone in the room, I think this is always worth remembering, Louise Erdrich um, had to tie herself to a chair to write her first novel with silk scarves. And she had coffee within reach, and she had cigarettes within reach. This was a while ago. Um, and that was how she wrote. And I think it's just, it's a very common thing that just staying, you know, seated can be so difficult for precisely those reasons that were articulated of the voices and the fears and the doubts that come up. Okay. So what Lynn was referring to is part of why I called my memoir What We Carry is because while I was caring for my mom and my very young child, I, that was when I got into weightlifting. And in a novel, I could not have gotten away with this, right? Because you would think, like, where does this person have the time? Um, I was fried. I was exhausted. I had no help during that period. So there was no nanny, there was no in-home aid, there was no cleaning lady. I was in a juncture that was a lot. And what I found was at the end of the day, I needed to be able to go somewhere and just take everything that I had lived and felt and experienced and undergone and witnessed that day and put it somewhere. And weightlifting allowed me to do that. And I think for so many women who carry so much in our daily lives, right? Like 
the needs of others, thinking about others, anticipating other people's needs, trying to think about what can I do that will help that person. So much of that, it isn't just about executing. It isn't just about doing. It's that thought and that mental anticipation and that emotional load. So what I always say, and that's how I became a competitive caliber weightlifter, was during that period of all times. I did it because I needed it. And so what I say to people is that for me, weightlifting has never been about picking up what's heavy. It's really about the chance to set it all down. She did the thing. Yeah, she did. She, she did, did the it. Thing. Thank you all. Thank you, Emma and Maya. Yay. We really love this talk. We will be back here with the amazing Rita Dove, and Andre Bernard will be interviewing her, and Deval Patrick will be introducing them, and we'll see you at five. Thank you. Oh, and Emma and Maya will be signing books in the front hall, but you know that by now. <laughs>